with an ex-WWE employee being appointed to a position in AEW and more. This is Wrestling Rambles. My name is John and you're watching the Wrestling Report. Hyping up a match against Private Party on AEW Dynamite, the Young Bucks wrote this on X. Hi team, we are excited to share the ring once again with these two young rock stars this Wednesday. Many people may have forgotten, but they were two of our first personal signees. Circling back to this first round tournament rematch after all of these years was a brilliant idea that came straight from our desk. Unfortunately, lightning rarely strikes the same place twice. Regardless, we know these two will crush it and put in their best effort. Regards, Matthew Jackson and Nicholas Jackson, AEW EVPs. At a WWE live event, Nia Jax could be seen at ringside being fed popcorn by a fan. <laughs> Talking to Les Thatcher and Victor Sosa on Wrestling Weekly, AEW commentator Nigel McGuinness said this about recently getting back in the ring. I think there's a lot of similarities between your career and I certainly, all the time that I was in WWE, how difficult it was for me, and I think a lot of the, I don't want to say the jealousy and the bitterness, but those sort of emotions that certainly existed between me and Brian Danielson and the success that he had. Obviously, when I was in WWE, seeing so many of my peers coming up and having that level of success and that level of fame and the fortune was very difficult for me, certainly to sort of accept especially when i can still wrestle today you know i got in the ring last week and just felt perfectly okay sometimes people say it's a lot easier if you choose yourself to quit and i don't think that it's the case Reviewing AEW's booking of Sting, The Undertaker noted on his Six Feet Under podcast the smart thing that he did. He was booked judiciously. He wasn't put in situations where he may have got exposed and not be able to keep up with the younger talent. It was probably him because you have to understand your limitations. A lot of times, people will get caught up in the moment. Let's put Sting in the ring with such and such. I'm just talking about AEW. There would have been tons of singles matches for him, but he took Darby Allen. There was chemistry there. And Sting was in a big brother type role. Father Time is never lost. He's undefeated. I'm not saying any disparaging about Sting. It is what it is. In my heart and my mind, if I could, I would still be in the ring, but I had to come to the cold hard facts that what my mind, eyes, and what my heart feels, my body wants no part of. It wants no part of it, and it doesn't allow me to do what I want to do. Could I go out there on my sweat equity? Hell yeah, I could. I'm not patting myself on the back, but I don't think there is anybody in the business that can throw a punch like I can throw a punch. I can choke slam. I'm not messing up my brand new knees with a tombstone, but I can walk out there and smoke and mirror it and make people feel like they saw something. That's just not right. People pay too much money to be entertained properly. Staying on the topic of the dead man, Kevin Owens revealed how a match between himself and The Undertaker was considered for WrestleMania 32, telling WrestleSphere, I think things just shifted and that was the year that Shane McMahon returned, so obviously at the time, my standing in the company compared to Shane McMahon coming back after all those years, the thought was probably Shane McMahon versus The Undertaker is a huge match. I know it was on the table and it was heavily discussed and it would have been amazing. My first WrestleMania to be in there with The Undertaker would have been sweet it didn't happen but i've been in the ring with him i was actually in the ring with him in the main event of a madison square garden show so i got to do that with him which was really cool Going over the origin of a nickname she received in her youth, Rhea Ripley said this on the Impulsive Podcast. I got a nickname in high school, Nutcracker, for a reason, because I used to hit people in the nuts. Being in a relationship with my partner, we scrap a little bit, I normally start, and I finish it.
mentioning what it is like to be in the women's locker room of WWE. Maxine Dupree told Gracie Norton of Wellness Her Way, A misconception is what our locker room is like. I think people assume that it's catty and everyone is at each other's throats. We have the most fun locker room. It's unreal. We have the best time. We have a locker room filled with the most amazing women who are so talented and trying to lift each other up. I was not expecting that when I got called up. I was nervous. I didn't know. When I got called up, I was like, oh, this is amazing. If you lean into that role with a kind heart and a loving hand, everyone reciprocates that back and it's awesome. Revealing how she was feeling following her last woman standing match on Raw from March 18th against Nia Jax, Becky Lynch said this to the Black Announce Table podcast. Oh, my spine is so sore. My tailbone is fine. Actually, I've been trying to bulk. Nobody's noticed. Nobody's made any comments, but I have been bulking lately. I keep telling people so that hopefully people will start being like, oh, hey man, you look like you're bulking up. Nobody said anything. Anyway, I think that protected my tailbone on that leg drop through the announce table, but my spine. I think when she Samoan dropped me on that chair, one of the legs of the chair just went right into my spine in that real tender point. But apart from that, I'm great. My neck is a little tricky my shoulder is a little anyway i'm fine for the most part i like anything where there's some weaponry you know what i mean i like to use a weapon i like to see how far i can push it i like it too because you can get creative with weapons you can do things you can put a chair here and there again there's just a million things you can do so whenever i see stipulation i'm usually excited for it whether it be a last woman standing extreme rules whatever but man i'm hyped for anything i'm hyped for any sort of match anytime i can get in the ring and just beat the bejesus out of some poor young one i'm happy about it Addressing the possibility of having heat with his former tag team partner, Ortiz, ex-AEW star Santana told Chris Van Vliet, I wouldn't say I have heat with Ortiz. I mean, for me, I don't hold any. I told him after the match, I was like, yo, I hope the best for you. I hope you do well. And there's no hard feelings. I hold no hate, no grudge, nothing like that. Again, I'm in a different place in my life in general, and I'm good. During that same interview, Santana said this regarding talks he has had with WWE following his departure from AEW. Yeah, I've had some discussions with WWE. I've been very open with everybody, you know, right now. It's just about going where I can grow the most. I don't want to just be another guy on the roster. I've already done that. I want to be part of something special, you know. Thankfully, I've been smart with money, so I'm not hurting. I'm taking my time with things, and I just want to have fun. Santana also revealed the reason for his exit from AEW saying my decision to leave AEW came well before my injury actually I got hurt in June of 2022 and at that point I was just dealing with so much of my life personally and professionally at work I was just burnt out and my contract was coming up in September I believe and I had already made a decision that I'm not going to re-sign and I'm going to just I need to take a break and deal with the things that I needed to deal with then the injury happened so that was a lot was going on during that time did i wasn't really actively pursuing like the time was coming up like i said in uh, june i got hurt our contract was up august i wasn't really like actively pursuing or are you guys going to re-sign us or because already in my head i was like yo i need to get away i need to take a break but i'm sure something would have worked out you know they probably would have re-signed us but yeah man during that time it was just it was a very dark time for me Touching on a new role for a former WWE employee, Ringside News wrote that AEW has announced the appointment of former WWE employee Kosha Irby as their new chief operating officer, marking a significant addition to the company's leadership team. In a statement released by AEW CEO Tony Khan, it was revealed that Irby will oversee strategic planning and execution across various aspects of AEW's business, including live events, marketing, 
finance, human resources, licensing, and consumer products. Irby brings with him a wealth of experience from his previous roles, including Chief Marketing Officer at Clemson University's Athletic Department, as well as positions at the Memphis Express of the Alliance of American Football, Professional Bull Riders, PBR, and WWE, where he served as Regional Director of Live Events. Kosha brings decades of experience within the sports, entertainment, and wrestling industries alongside an incredible work ethic and passion for our brand, stated Khan. As Chief Operating Officer, he will be a phenomenal asset to AEW as we enter the next phase of the company's ongoing business development and expansion. Irby's hiring had been previously reported by Ringside News in January, and further details regarding his role within AEW are expected to be revealed in due course. Explaining her photo with Seth Rollins where they are posing naked with WWE titles covering them, Becky Lynch told Clutch Points, It's just funny. It had to get out in the world at some point. It's just too silly and fun not to. It was one of those things that happened because Seth and I are at the worst at taking photos. We just never take photos together. And so that was the day before I was going to lose one of those titles and I was like, we gotta get this done otherwise I'm not going to have it. We'd just gotten back from Europe on a two week tour. We were both exhausted and it was just like, all right, let's go. It was just so funny and silly. Giving his view of The Rock's involvement in the Roman Reigns and Cody Rhodes angle, former WWE star Nick Nemeth noted on Busted Open Radio, it does make Roman look like a little brother. A little bit. We'd a year and nine months before The Rock of this two-year story, so I get it. We all know The Rock's involved. We all know that the back and forth has only been Rock and Cody. Let's get back to the championship match. I really think I want them to sell me on WrestleMania, not just watching on TV. Why I need to be in the building for this moment. Crediting the current success he has been having in WWE to his character work, Drew McIntyre said this in an interview with CBS Sports. It's a lot very much to do with his things are now. Things were a certain way and obviously it was very, very successful. Look how much the company grew, but eventually it's good to try new things, get a fresh pair of eyes on it and say, all right, let's let the performers go for it. Let's maybe try things that have never been tried. Let's maybe involve characters in multiple stories at the same time time rather than just story A and story B and the rest is kind of random matches across card. Everything is meaning, everyone has meaning and we can cross these characters, doesn't matter if they're both bad, doesn't matter if they're both good, right now it's just what's your point. Where is this character coming from? Oh, this is interesting. As long as it's interesting television, compelling television, it touches you emotionally. That's all that matters and should really matter. It's awesome to see how many people have been able to step up, and every time someone's music hits, the fans know, oh, that's such and such, they're about his. They mean something. It hasn't been that way probably since late 99, early 2000, where everybody across the board meant something. Recalling his match against Cody Rhodes at the All-In event in 2018, Nick Aldis said this to Inside the Ropes. I think in this business, if you start playing the comparison game, you can really go down a rabbit hole of bitterness and resentment very quickly. I felt a little bit betrayed when I found out that they were all familiar, they were all aware of Tony Khan, and they'd been sort of plotting this thing. So then as we progressed a couple of months forward, it's sort of like, oh, that's all already happening. That's sort of a done deal. Sort of in that respect. I guess I felt like I could have been informed of that sooner, but I just looked at it from the perspective of like, well, that piece of business meeting Cody and I at All In, that did nothing but good things for everyone involved. It wasn't like people looked at me and went, oh, he's finished. 
We tore the house down and we had the match that everybody remembers. We had the real main event of that show that built my credibility. Off the back of that, we were able to launch an entire show that at that time had a strong, sustainable audience. I landed a six-figure contract off the back of that also. Cody obviously had a pipeline to a billionaire. It is a different. I only had a millionaire hit a billionaire, but whatever. It's all just part of the tapestry of your career. I certainly didn't resent Cody. If anything, I was grateful to Cody because the success of that show was certainly not dependent on me. They weren't going to sell those they sold those tickets no matter what i always say i didn't draw the house but i felt like i made the show what it was i felt like what cody and i's match did was kind of show that it can be done outside of wwe like a moment storytelling emotion the big fight feel the delivery of the big match and the fairy tale ending can happen somewhere else with the right guys look cody was the right guy but i was the right guy too i felt like it underlined me as this guy could do it too For information regarding the promo segment between CM Punk, Drew McIntyre, and Seth Rollins on Raw, Fightful reported that the buzzworthy promo saw each man taking shots at one another repeatedly during the show. It had a much more loose feeling, and if those in WWE are to be believed, it was as scripted as many other we've seen. This would seem obvious in the past, but even some of the most emotional promos that many thought weren't scripted ended up being scripted word for word. Instead, the claim internally is that there was a general outline and are told that the talent knew they were all going to just go for it and see what happens. Recalling how she suffered an injury in WWE, Ronda Rousey said this in an interview with Cage Side Seats. It gave me a concussion, being slapped by Stephanie McMahon at Elimination Chamber in 2018. Nikki Bella gave me an open hand slap in the days leading to their match at Evolution, and I was seeing stars, and I had a headache for the rest of the day. I didn't want to say anything. I didn't want them to say, oh, you can't do this match that you've been preparing for. You can't do this, can't do that. And I had a lifetime of experience hiding concussions. And so now that I've basically put all of that behind me, I can finally be open about these things. When it comes to an update on the criminal case against former WWE star Ted DiBiase Jr., Ringside News wrote that Ted DiBiase Jr., though carrying the weight of his father's legacy in professional wrestling, did not achieve the same level of fame during his tenure in WWE. However, he will now be remembered for his involvement in an embezzlement scheme where millions of dollars were misappropriated in a significant scam. In fact, his criminal case has now been postponed to 2025. Ted DiBiase Jr. is involved in Mississippi's largest welfare embezzlement scam in the state's history and is facing numerous serious charges. The son of the million dollar man pled guilty to one count of conspiracy to defraud the United States. Brett DiBiase previously pled guilty to two charges in Hintz County Circuit Court. He was also charged with six counts of wire fraud and four counts of money laundering. The former WWE superstar is currently facing up to five years in federal federal prison and a fine of up to $250,000 in addition to a sentence in state court. If convicted on all counts, DiBiase could face a maximum of 45 years imprisonment and a million dollar fine. DiBiase was supposed to stand trial on July 16th of 2024 with a pre-trial conference set for the 21st of June in 2024. However, PW Insider reported that Mississippi Southern District Courts Judge Carlton W. Reeves has recused himself from the criminal trial against former WWE star Ted DiBiase Jr. in Mississippi. The reason for this recusal was not specified. Magistrate Judge Lakeisha Greer Isaac has been appointed to oversee the trial in place of Judge Reeves. Due to these developments, the jury trial against DiBiase Jr. has been rescheduled to January 7th of 2025. On Raw, Seth Rollins and Jey Uso can be seen walking to the back from the ring despite Cody Rhodes being attacked by The Rock. Here's the clip.
and this was your pro wrestling news update i hope you're all having a great day thank you so much for watching and i will see y'all later